Actually, for me, it is a little bit challenging module because uh, by now this time you would have realized I'm an essentially an endoscopic and a, a GI surgeon. But having said that, as an undergraduate, you ought to know a lot of important topics and other specialties also, be it endocrinology like thyroid or a breast or vascular like peripheral vascular disease or a acute and chronic vascular disease, varicose vein, or for example, in urology, a renal mass or a case of acute or a chronic retention of urine, a patient presenting with a painful scrotum or a torsion testis, undescended testis, hydrocell, testicular tumor, or ureteric colic. Like that, there are a lot of other urological importance wherein you need to know a bit, especially these are asked either in the MCQ or in the short notes or sometimes in the viva. And if you are uh, having an essay, I wouldn't be surprised, especially a testicular tumor uh, seems to be a fairly a common thing and also renal cell carcinoma. So there are situations. So how much of time you allot for each speciality is a challenge. So I've seen in my experience as an undergraduate several decades ago. So I took this little challenge myself rather than asking one of my colleagues, a urologist by nature to do this topic. I thought I'll do it for myself because when I speak, I can speak for you rather than a urologist speaks where he'll speak for the speciality where he'll go into deeper and deeper into the speciality, that will be too much for you as an undergraduate. So that's the very reason I myself took the challenge of addressing this common topics, the top 12 topics. In other words, if you are with me for the next about 90 minutes or so, I'm sure you will have a great, I mean, very good confidence of writing. If not an essay, at least uh, two or three pages of each topic, those 12 topics confidently without referring to either Hamilton Bailey or any other book. Because if you are already following my style of teaching, you know the template. That is whenever you are asked any pathology or any problem in surgery, if it is a theoretical background, you have to identify why this problem occurred, etiopathology. The pathology, if you are very good in your pathological class, then you can go back and tell even the macroscopic, microscopic feature of a given cancer. I'll give an example. If it is a renal cell carcinoma, what is a type of carcinoma? Adenocarcinoma or a clear cell carcinoma. It is otherwise called a hypernephroma and also named as a gravid tumor. All those names or whatever I just uttered, they are all familiar to you, nothing new. In other words, whatever you learn, whatever you could remember in your pathology class or anatomy class, you bring in in the ETO pathology or the basic anatomy. That is your introduction of any particular topic. Then as a clinician, as a final year student, you are sitting in front of the patient asking him, what's your problem? He'll say, sir, I have a hematuria or a dysuria like that. He'll have some urological. We are talking about urology today. So let us concentrate. So symptoms. Then you start examining the patient, inspect, palpate, percuss, auscultate, signs you will see. Then you investigate a urological case. Until Esther week, we were investigating GI. So everything on endoscopy or CT. Now it is going to be cystoscopy and CT. So it's slight difference, but essentially the same line of thinking. That's what I'm coming to. Then management, medical and surgical. If it is a cancer, it is a trimodal, that is surgical, radiological or radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So like that, you have to have a thinking process or a template ingrained in your brain by this time, by module 21. Okay, that's what I request all of you to have. Even if you have joined only for this class, having somebody, one of your friends said, why don't you attend? It is not going to be difficult. I told you, even yesterday, we shared with you a few of the links to the YouTube channel that is same surgery master class. So whenever you have a free time, at least an hour or so, you just go into that and recollect what you can remember on dyspepsia, dysphagia and things like that. So that will definitely will help you. I am sure at the end of our 30 class module, I'll share all the links. 
you can share with all your friends so i am sure i want it to be benefited not only for you or your friends but the whole country or whole i mean wherever the people in the cyber space can benefit because today i am going to touch 12 key topics in guru genital system as enumerated here in the upper gi or upper urinary tract lower urinary tract scrotum and testis very often they are also as a short case for you so it is both clinical theoretical class for you i'm based on your way of writing in the template based approach okay so with that little introduction let us go on see for example what are the common symptoms a patient will come with a urological or urinary symptoms basically you need to consider the patient is having a disease either in the upper urinary tract or in the lower urinary tract that is kidney pelvis ureter up to this is upper urinary sim symptoms that is whereas if it is a bladder disease or is a urethra or perianal region or scrotal region that is a lower urinary symptoms like that you keep it what about the upper urinary symptoms essentially a classical thing you can draw but is a stone in the ureter somewhere you imagine what will you have the pain because of the renal ureteric colic is going to be one sided from the loin to the groin loin to groin pain especially unilateral is a very typical or pathognomic of a you know, ureteric or a renal symptom very simple so long until last week we were telling epigastric pain foregut periumbilical pain midgut suprapubic pain hindgut now we were talking it is a central pain whereas here it is a lateral pain that is a right side loin to groin right kidney and ureter left side loin to groin pain left kidney and ureter very simple second of course if there is a renal disease they have hematuria or if they have an infection like pyelonephritis or a stone with the infection dysuria and usually not always usually because upper urine because kidney is highly perfused an infection within the kidney causes very easily a bacteremia spill over of the bacteria into the blood stream bacteremia so they are usually present with fever when you have inflammation there then there will be anorexia like appendicitis an inflammatory pathology they will don't feel like eating when our you have sepsis one of the indirect evidence of sepsis indirect evidence of malignancy in our body is anorexia so you have to say if the patient doesn't like to eat because each one of us six hours whether you like it or you feel hungry the hunger is less in these two classical conditions one severe infection of our body malignancy apart from that any other cause for hunger when we ask in our country at least you can say tuberculosis again it is an infection but at least you remember these are the three classical things i always expect people to know okay next lower urinary symptom that is the bladder and urethra here the pain obviously because of the bladder location is going to be suprapubic but what is important is in addition to the dysuria hematuria like any other urinary symptom they classically have three additional symptoms you need to know how to elicit these are the symptoms of bladder outlet obstruction in other words the detrusor muscle contracts the bladder wants to empty because you have bladder loaded with 500 ml of urine you don't try to void if you are not able to void what are the problem it may be the detrusor muscle itself is weak okay atonic bladder or there is an obstruction to the flow of urine either a maybe stricture at the neck of the urethra i mean the bladder neck obstruction or a prostate or something like a urethra is having a stricture if any of these are present then patient will have over stream first common thing is they'll say sir i used to pass a very good stream of urine now it is a dribbling like a drops even when i strain it's not coming like a stream or a jet it's a dribbling okay i can't point uh, point the stream okay to the wall like something like so it is a poor stream second thing is whenever you have inflammation of the bladder especially the trigone of the bladder you have that urge to 
void urine that is called strangury what is strangury there is a terminology it is a urge to urinate you have the intense desire to urinate but as soon as you go to the toilet to pass urine there is nothing in the bladder it is just the feel it is like intense desire to defecate is what tenismus tenismus is a sign of or symptom of proctitis inflamed rectum whereas here the trigonitis or cystitis will present like a strangury or urgency sometimes urgency can be also because of the unstable or uh, I mean bladder contraction like a bladder dysgenergia something like that okay hesitancy what is hesitancy that is something obstructing that is for example if there is no tra i mean a traffic jam the urine will flow but when there is a traffic jam because of the enlarged prostate you go to the toilet to pass urine as a male and once you a uh, signal you give the signal with right you are not able to initiate passing the urine it takes extra 5 minutes before you start letting the urine come out that's because these are all the symptoms you clearly understood so understand without mincing the words then only you can ask the right question to get the right answer because uh, patients uh, won't be able to describe what is hesitancy urgency you have to put it in their own language first for that you need to really understand what you are trying to tell so both of you should speak their same language the question you ask the answer he gives are right only if he understands your question properly that's where the difference between an experienced person asking question and as a beginner as undergraduate you are asking question so you have to learn to talk to the patient in their own language if there is a person coming from a layman coming you need to address it slightly differently if it is same person he is a blue scholar or he is a computer literate he might have read all these symptoms if you tell do you have hesitancy he'll say yes sir. like that he'll say or he'll say sir i also have nocturia he'll just try to coin some words for you so nocturia obviously you means all of us or most of us we don't get up at night because our bladder capacity is so good but you can have a nocturia especially if you have a bladder neck obstruction nocturia more than two times you get up at night abnormal it disturbs your sleep that is usually a sign of some pathology inside the bladder or a bladder outlet okay coming to the investigations if such patients are coming you examine you made the diagnosis what investigations you do for the upper urinary tract for uh, investigating the disease of the kidney disease of the ureter all investigations fall under this heading hematological biochemical radiological same things i'm not telling anything different so blood investigation you do for example if the patient is having a renal cell carcinoma hematuria and sometimes they can have anemia but sometimes even blood I mean the renal cell carcinoma rarely they are associated with the polycythemia also you go and read so like that there are some in so you can tell renal cell carcinoma sometimes are found to be associated with the polycythemia then um, of course if there is a bilateral renal disease like both kidneys are obstructed or infected then they may not function normally so there is a abnormal renal function test with a raised urea raised creatinine may be present and the renal disease are more common in diabetic patients okay a diabetic patient is more prone for urinary sepsis or diabetic nephropathy for that matter so sugar you invariably do in all case of urinary diseases or renal diseases electrolytes very very important a chronic renal failure or acute renal failure patients very often they have hyperkalemia increased potassium which is lethal to the patient system so you need to look for the thing especially if they have a raised urea and creatinine what do you look for potassium level and what other things you can do an ecg what is the ecg for to see the changes in the ecg to look for any hyperkalemia what is the hyperkalemia ecg changes sometimes t wave inversion or hyper acute t waves tall t waves so all these are very very fundamental you need to know okay and how will you treat a patient with hyperkalemia they will ask you insulin glucose infusion okay so that will cause the potassium to come out so it will it will be utilized with the insulin and the thing it will make sure the potassium levels comes down next is a urine examination and culture so urine for red cells 
pustules cast cells albumin and microscopy any bacteria if so what bacteria culture and sensitivity all these things are necessary if you suspect any infection and usually glomerulonephritis or a pyelonephritis that is a renal disease or tubular disease you will have casts okay various casts you might have heard whereas if it is ureteric problem or a bladder problem cast is not here so cast cast is a very important observation if you have a renal disease okay next of course is a xakub for you the radiological investigation of choice is i'll do x ray of the kidney ureter bladder region to look for any calculi because of rule of 80 now 80% of the renal ureteric stones are radio opaque unlike gall bladder stone where 80% of them are radio lucent so that is the interesting observation next intravenous urogram to see the functional and anatomical state of the kidney a ct of kidney ureter bladder region for any infective or neoplastic process hypernephroma or a bladder tumor you want to stage them anybody you want to stage tnm stage you have to go for a ct scan no other thing wherever whatever condition in our body so in oncological conditions always you write contrast ct scan here you have to write ct kidney ureter and bladder region then another thing is isotope scan scans are increasingly used for example you have two kidneys if two kidneys are obstructed or infected you want to know which kidney is more affected than the other kidney how to do the differential function between these two kidneys how they assess by doing a isotope scan because the uptake clearance of the isotope in a map it will give you clearly the indication to the nephrologist urologist which kidney is more damaged which kidney you can say it is relatively better safe like that so that is a differential function isotope scan is very immense used in thyroid we have seen it parathyroid systemic scan warthin's tumor we discussed other day for a parotid tumor like that isotope scan itself is an essay for a prize exam for students coming to the lower urinary system for example what investigation hematological urological radiological again and some special investigations again same thing of course very many time they usually have and the bladder cancer one of the common find if you imagine if you have a transitional cell carcinoma whenever anybody ask you what is the cancer cell or can type of cancer you have in bladder don't think too much you just go into your histology class if you are can remember what is the normal lining normal lining is a transitional cell so it is a transitional cell carcinoma the exception to this rule of lining is only some places where there is a metaplasia there there may be some different cancer for example lower end of esophagus even though it is originally lined by stratified squamous epithelium because of the parrots changes it becomes an adenocarcinoma otherwise it's ought to be a squamous cell carcinoma okay stomach lined by glandular epithelium so it is adenocarcinoma so you need to know all those different types of pathology there so here it is a transitional cell carcinoma okay so pathology is not that difficult coming back to the blood test one other important blood test here is a tumor marker you should realize prostate prostate specific antigen less than 5 is normal 5 to 10 is borderline above 10 is significant and if they have raised psa all patients with the raised prostate specific antigen and a hard nodular prostate on rectal examination so undergo an additional investigation to confirm whether you have a prostatic adenocarcinoma and that investigation is true cut biopsy an ultrasound guided true cut by a small core of tissue is taken from the i mean a prostate and see under microscope if it proves to be a prostatic cancer then you decide on the treatment okay and also it can spread through the blood stream to the vertebra and extra so you need to do a bone scan for the patient with the psa raised okay this is the next thing you need to realize 
Coming to the very important thing is what about the X-ray again? Here also bladder calculi. Very often you will be seeing a patient coming with dysuria, urgency, supra pubic pain. You do an X-ray KUB like a big like an orange size, sometimes even lemon size, single stone will be present. That is because of the large bladder calculi. Okay, very often you see that patient. Eh? Because 80% of the calculi, renal system, they're all radiopaque. So there is no need for more expensive investigations. But when you do an IVU, intravenous urogram, people will ask you, what are the prerequisites? First, patient has to come overnight fasting, number one. Number two, the patient has to have a bowel preparation. So there is no gas shadow because that will hide the pelvic calicial pattern seen in the IVU. That is a second important thing. Third, you have to ensure the patient's creatinine is normal. If they have abnormal creatinine, like for example, three or four, four milligram, you should not do IVU. One, the urography, the IV contrast you are giving, that it is nephrotoxic, that will make things worse. Second, because it is not excreted by the already non-functioning kidney, it, the investigation is futile. So you, in, in, instead of that, you need to do some other tests. So three things, overnight starvation, bowel preparation by giving them a couple of uh, the Dalcolax, okay, Dalcoflux tablet. Third, of course, is ensure serum creatinine is normal. Okay. Next, of course, the CTK will be plain for the stone. But if you are suspecting any tumor, you have to give a contrast. But when you take a contrast, urograph in contrast, ensure the patient is having a normal serum creatinine. Okay. What are the special investigations we do for a lower urinary system, in particular diagnostic? Diagnostic flexible cystoscopy. You pass a small camera, video camera, through the urethra into the bladder. You can have a look if there's any bladder, especially in a patient with a painless hematuria. Okay, hematuria is of two times. One, you have a pain followed by blood in the urine. Patients may not be panicked because pain was there. So there's some, they themselves think there is some infection. Whereas if they go to the toilet, to their surprise, to their surprise, suddenly they think the urine is not no longer straw colored. It is like a blood. They faint also seeing on the, so much of blood is coming. Passing a frank, painless hematuria is a telltale symptom in an elderly patient of transitional cell carcinoma. Very, very important. Sometimes it can happen also in prostatic cancer, things, but this is the commonest thing. Whenever you have a painless hematuria, whenever you have a progressive dysphagia, both are dangerous signs of two tumors. Painless hematuria, elderly, bladder cell carcinoma, cystoscopy. Dysphagia, progressive dysphagia for solids, elderly person, CA is the biggest upper GA endoscopy. So very simple, effective message to all the people who are going to do a general practice. Okay. Next, of course, is a ascending urethrogram. What is ascending urethrogram? You just put a small tube into the urethra, inject contrast. As you inject, you see the thing. There are parts of the urethra you know. Okay. So membranous part, okay, prostatic part penile part, wherever there is a stricture or narrowing, you'll be able to find out. So that's about it. Now let's go on five minutes or so for each topic. That's what I'm going to give. Four topics in upper urinary tract for exam going students. What is the minimum requirement? I'm not telling this is enough. This is the bare minimum as an undergraduate. I want you to memorize, remember for your rest of your life. If you know more than this, it is a bonus for you. Okay, with that little caveat, I'll go. Here is a hydronephrosis, they'll ask you. Because some senior examiners are very fond of definitions. Define ulcer, they'll ask you. Define swelling. What is the difference between hydronephrosis, pyonephrosis? Hydronephrosis is aseptic dilatation of kidney due to obstruction to the urine flow. That is aseptic, that word is important. 
dilatation of the kidney. For example, you have to imagine if there is a bladder or urethra is obstructed, both sides, ureter is dilated, hydro ureter, the pelvis is dilated, hydro pelvis, then calicial system also dilated, hydro calyx, then the whole kidney is distended or a dilate way. That is hydronephrosis. So that's a hydro nephrosis is a combination of hydrocalyx, hydro pelvis, hydro ureter. If it is one side, it is usually an obstruction in the ureter, like here, stone. If it is both sides, that means the obstruction has to be in the common channel. The common channel here is either a bladder or a urethra. Very simple, isn't it? So you have to consider. So what is the difference with hydronephrosis? Nothing but a yeah, aseptic urine collection. A kidney is a bag of urine, hydronephrosis. Whereas pyonephrosis, kidney is a bag of pus. Bag of pus, you have to drain. Hydronephrosis, you need to make sure you have a permanent operation done. Okay, you can't do externally drain, but internally you have to make a passage for hydronephrosis. Treatment is essentially a surgical, either a stent insertion or a procedure like a pyloplasty, we call it. We'll come to that. So essentially there are two types. As I said, if it is a bilateral, it is a common channel. There is somewhere in the lower urinary obstruction like a benign prostatic urethra or I mean, hyperplasia. Whereas if it is a unilateral ureteric obstruction. Then coming to the investigation, very important investigation is apart from urine, IVP, you can see the hydrosalpings, uh, hydrocalysis, DTPA, isotope scan is very important because that will clearly tell you which kidney is more hydronephrotic or more damaged than the other one. One of the treatment we say for these people, especially the commonest condition is there is some narrowing right at the pelvic ureteric junction. PU junction obstruction is the commonest cause for hydronephrosis. That is the case. We resect that area, okay, like that, and then we'll join it, okay. So this resection of this area and joining is called Anderson Heinz pyeloplasty. So if you write this particular thing, two things will determine whether you are getting a two good marks or not. You have to write the DTPA isotope scan to know the differential function. Second, an operation of choice is Anderson Heinz pyeloplasty. Okay, these are the two things you should know. Coming to the next one, urolithiasis. Tomorrow, imagine one of your relatives or for the matter, one of the patients in the ward if you're going to see, he is complaining of, sir, yesterday, last night, I went to bed, no problem. Suddenly, 2 a.m., I got up with the severe pain. They'll actually keep the hand on the loin, loin to groin pain, so severe, I couldn't sleep. I never had this bad pain any time in my life. I wish I don't get it anymore. Please do something. So that is a very vivid description. In other words, the pain visual analog score of 8 or even 10. That is usually because of the stone, either in the kidney or in the pelvis or in the ureter, a common condition. But rarely the stone may be also in the bladder, where the pain is more suprapubic. Whereas the ureteric calling only will give you that severe pain because of the stone in these places. And the, why people develop stones? We say you are not drinking enough amount of fluid, but that is easily said than done. It is mainly consuming a diet rich in calcium, like milk products, or oxalate, like tomato and things like that, or urate, like non-veg items. Or it may be because of the stasis in the kidney or ureter, causes a triple phosphate stone. See, the phosphate stones are mainly because of the infection. Oxalate stones or calcium and oxalate, they form a the thick radiopaque stones. They are usually because of the eating too much of calcium containing or oxalate, that is tomato and things like that. Rarely, it could be a, one of the important presentation of hyperparathyroidism. You remember renal stone, psychic moans, abdominal groans or signs of the parathyroidism. Okay, increased PTH, parathermal hormone. Coming to the next thing, symptom I told you. This is the very typical patient. You remember this, visualize this patient. He'll be showing. And if you do an X-ray KUB, they'll be stored. Very easily seen in 80% of the people. 
where you look for the stone you this is the vertebra well okay you always saw this is the sacrum this is a sacroiliac joint this is the pelvic brim and if you follow the pelvic pelvic brim carefully just close to the hip joint middle as per here is the pubic the ischial spine so ischial spine is somewhere here i am sure here you can appreciate better ischial spine here where my arrow is saying ischial spine so look at the ischial spine next landmark is sacroiliac joint next landmark is tip of the transverse process from l1 to l5 like this from l1 to l5 you draw an imaginary line along the tips of the transverse process of the lumbar vertebra go along this sacroiliac joint and go towards the ischial spine to the midline that is the course of the ureter if you have any radio opaque shadow along this path in a patient with a line to groin pain that is a classical presentation of ureteric stone unless proved otherwise okay tip of the transverse process sacroiliac joint ischial spine draw them all that is a surface marking for ureter if i am an examiner this is what i'll ask you in addition dysuria hematuria you might have fever if you have infected urine because of stasis and they'll say if you press there on the loin they'll have severe pain okay that's about the findings how will you manage this ureteric colic tomorrow you imagine you are a brother or your father or uncle is coming and they are showing a x ray or an ultrasound showing a ureteric stone you should know because you are after all you are a more or less 90% doctor now conservative treatment first important thing in urology is especially stone diseases because they do recur recurrence is a rule than exception so you try to manage them conservatively make them drink some fluids give them some analgesics with a bit of luck the stone will pass by our naturalis how big a stone a small stone less than 5 Centi five millimeter. So you remember if five with your finger number of finger five mm stone or less. If there is no infection, you give them analgesic fluids. They'll come. If they are six millimeter and above, then they usually need a treatment. It could be either of these three modalities. The modality number one is ESWL, extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy. patient is lying in a shock wave machine short shock waves are focused on the kidney stone on either side help of the software technology so because of the focused shock wave the stone is pulverized the word is important pulverized even a 1 cm 2 cm stone is pulverized a big stone is now becoming a powder like a chalk piece and patient will pass in the urine during the passage to prevent pain sometimes we put a small stent in the ureter so this is a very simple outpatient treatment all you need to give is some mild analgesics during the i mean a treatment process it is not done in the hospital setting it can be done in a investigation like you can go outside in any labs like a ct scan center there are various eswl center okay there is one treatment but now thanks to the endoscopic removal ESWL is now less and less commonly done procedure. That is also you should know. Ninety percent of the urological treatment is by endotherapy, uro endotherapy. How you do? If the stone is in the upper system, that is in the kidney or in the pelvis, you go through the back of your line through the loin straight to the kidney. That is called a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Okay, ultrasound guided. So this way you can go straight and take the stone out or break the stone. PCNL called. Or if it is in the lower part of the ureter or in the bladder, for that matter, you go via naturalis through the urethra. That is called a ureteroscopy. Ureteroscopy is longer than a cystoscope, so it will go right inside uh, inside the ureter. And you have a uh, two different devices to take care of the stone. So one is a dormia basket. which will like a fish net it will go and grab it either pulverize it or drag it outside or you have laser or you can have a various hydro i mean uh, treatment or pneumatic uh, 
forces can be used so that they can go for a lithotripsy. Lithotripsy is nothing but breaking the stone by using a various devices. Okay, pneumatic lithotripsy. Okay, hydraulic lithotripsy. Laser lithotripsy. Now, holmium laser, for example, is commonly used for bile duct stone also. So, laser lithotripsy. So, this is what happens. If you see, go via the naturalis, bladder, go into the ureter opening, right side, left side, here in the left side, go to the, even in the mid ureter, go and grab it with the dormia basket and bring it out. Okay. Very simple, effective thing. But after all this procedure, they usually put a patient with a stent. Uretric stent that stays there for about two to three weeks because to prevent any edema or instrument induced um, inflammation of the kidney or a ureter. For that, they usually have a stent. So, if anybody asks you what do you do with the stent, after two weeks you can remove the stent, sir. Then open surgery. Now, one liner seldom done. We don't open anybody for that matter in order to remove a stone disease. Open surgery is still done only for a tumor conditions like a renal cell carcinoma. So here, for example, opening the kidney and taking the stone out, nephrolithotomy, pyelolithotomy, ureterolithotomy. They are all only found in the books. We don't do it. But you have to mention for classification. You should understand the terminology. Ureterolithotomy is open surgery, exposure of the ureter, and then making a small incision in the ureter, take the stone out and suture the ureter after putting a stent, sir. That is ureterolithotomy. Okay. Then prevention. How will you prevent this recurrent? Of course, take, take plenty of fluids. That is a, another chapter over. What is the next one? Renal tuberculosis. Okay. Tuberculosis, you all know, it affects lung, but that is only about 80%. There are people presenting with the abdominal tuberculosis, which we saw in the last class or a few classes before. It can affect also the renal system. And one of the presentation is they usually present with increased frequency of urine or hematuria, along with, of course, evening fever, weight loss, because evening rise of temperature, anorexia, weight loss. Three cardinal symptoms of tuberculosis in our country. In addition, if you send the urine for culture, because you can't culture the organisms like tuberculosis basically in our routine culture, the report usually comes as negative. So you have a patient who has puzzles the urine, but there is no bacteria seen. That means that bacteria is actually acid phase bacilli. Unless you do this special stain, okay, acid fast bacilli stain, or you send it to the LJ media and culture, special culture for tuberculosis, you will miss this diagnosis. So sterile pyuria. Okay, puzzles plenty, no bacteria seen in a patient with a evening rise of temperature is renal tuberculosis unless proved otherwise. There you have to send the early morning specimen of urine to look for acid fast bacilli and also send for culture. That is another important thing. The pathology inside could be initiated as because of the bacteremia, one of the bacilli will go and lodge in the calicial pattern, cause a papillary ulcer, or it can cause a bag of pus, a tuberculosis involving the whole kidney. That is a pyonephrosis and then burst open in the perinephric phase, like a perinephric abscess, or the whole kidney is like a cake now. KCS kidney, KCS necrosis, or later it can get calcified so that you can see a calcification like a stone, I mean a kidney size. There are two types of big calcification in the kidney region. One, of course, is a staggered calculus, which is within the pelvis. Second is a calcified kidney after the KCS necrosis. The last one, rarely, you can have a miliary mottling of the kidney. That is called a miliary tuberculosis in a patient with the immunocompromise, like HIV patients. Okay. The treatment is essentially medical. TB, we seldom operate. You just do a, give them a 8 to 12 months of anti-tuberculosis treatment. For two months of four drug intensive phase, then two drugs. Okay. Some rarely, if it is a pyonephrosis 
or if it is already a destroyed kidney like caseus uh, calcified you may have to do a nephrectomy if it is involving only the bladder for example the bladder goes for a fibrosis what we call a thimble bladder the bladder is usually a capacity you can hold on up to 500 ml of urine but these people the bladder goes for a fibrosis like a fibrosis of lung here also fibrosis so the capacity is hardly 50 to 100 ml so they spend rest of the life only in the toilet frequency of urine they keep sir so half an hour once i have to go to the toilet to come night i go 10 times frequency nocturia how will you def- i mean uh, treat these patients by increasing the capacity of the bladder by enlarging the capacity by taking a part of the small intestine you take a ileum okay separately about 1 feet of ileum then join the other ileum sorry you just take one ileum with its blood supply separately and then open it like a textbook you join it on the dome of the bladder okay this is the dome of the bladder and then you do suturing all around to so create what you call a neo bladder something like a neo bladder is the whole bladder is created new here 50% patient's bladder 50% is a ileum as a augmented bladder so this is called augmentation cystoplasty that word is very important like anderson heinz operation pyeloplasty for hydronephrosis augmentation cystoplasty with this diagram will fetch you a mark if you write renal tuberculosis okay coming to the next one neoplasm of the kidney how much you should know i'll just keep it very simple for you wilms tumor or nephroblastoma in a pediatric age group if you have a 5 year old kid or a 3 year old kid mummy is saying hematuria a fever child not doing well think of wilms tumor very common or adult patients usually will come the other names are already given and i already you know the presentation is very simple they come with a loin pain hematuria fever very common okay and if they present what are the characteristic feature of renal cell carcinoma first of all they are usually spherical solitary tumor first important thing second most of the time it is in the upper pole of the kidney see the right side left side this is the kidney this is the cortex well perfused cortex this is the medulla this is the pelvis renal pelvis okay and this is the aorta ivc in front of the vertebra these are all the small bowel loops and you can see a bit of a liver here lower part of the liver here is the right kidney in front of the muscle psoas muscles so this kidney is very enlarged okay more or less three times the size and it is not functioning well because the functioning part of the kidney is here so you can see the cortex and middle of a normal kidney so this is something like this big tumor in the upper port and uh, two other classical feature of the kidney mass you have to write you will get all the marks one the tumor invades directly into the renal vein tumor embolus second ivc invasion the tumor invades into the ivc and it will keep so in other words when you do a nephrectomy sometimes we have to open the ivc remove all the tumor emboli from there otherwise there is a high chance the emboli will go into the where it will go ivc it will go into the sub right heart from there into the lungs so they will develop lung secondaries then later bone secondaries and cannon ball lung secondaries then expansile bone secondaries the ends of the long bones pulsatile secondaries only two conditions you have to remember i told you already follicular carcinoma thyroid renal carcinoma renal cell carcinoma these are the two common things causes pulsatile expansile secondaries whereas all other things will cause usually infiltrate like a dense region a prostatic ca will give secondaries but they are all osteo plastic they they they'll be like osteoblastic reaction they'll be dense okay white more whiter here it is lighting more black color and the tnm staging you write tnm staging that will do there is no need to write t i mean the what is t1 t2 t3 n1 n2 for renal cancer there are only some conditions where you need to know tnm staging completely one of course is a ca breast everybody second gastric cancer third if you want 
a lymphoma and fourth if you really want testicular tumor all other things like a pancreatic cancer renal cancer liver cancer if you are oncologist doing mcg well fine if you are an undergraduate don't spend unnecessarily your gray cells for the, all these things okay coming to the signs you will find a patient having a enlarged kidney renal mass that you should know how to feel then investigate ultrasound and then ct i told you ct is the best investigation ivp also done those days nowadays we don't do ivp ultrasound shows a renal mass we go for a ct straight away the treatment for renal cell carcinoma is 90% of them open surgery 10% of them we do laparoscopically what we do we remove the whole kidney with a gerotas fascia the whole thing along with the perinephric fat including the adrenal on that side with the ureter so it is a radical nephro ureterectomy that side so it is a n block removal n block is a cancer surgery so it is a n block removal of the kidney that's why the word radical is used okay coming to the next thing is what is the prognosis you can always say 50 50 i told you for all gi especially for a upper j esophagus stomach pancreas cholangiocarcinoma 10% now there was 5 years away it is 10% very poor only colonic cancer 30 to 40% okay average i'm telling whereas renal little better 5 year survival is 50% testicular tumor 80% hodgkin's tumor or thyroid like a papillary carcinoma more than 90 95 in other words most of them they live so if you are cursed with a cancer you pray god why don't you give me a papillary carcinoma of thyroid or even a, i mean that is better even we don't want to have a lymphoma because there the chemotherapy is much more lethal papillary carcinoma is the one of the best cancer one can have next in that is a probably a small focal prostatic cancer also nowadays eminently curable there are some eminently curable conditions okay but just hindsight but whereas upper j cancers by far they are nasty cancer very bad kidney 50 50 that's about some some ideas about all these things which are not usually given i'm sure you all know by last class how to examine a renal mass you go and this is the way to feel the right kidney and that is the way to feel the left kidney between the fingers it is by manually palpable and if you ask a patient to take a deep breathing the kidney you can feel a eh, palpable between your two hands and it is moving up and down moves with the respiration and also if you toss the hand like this from the behind you can feel it from the hand cupped in front palpable and then what do you do you can confirm it is confining to one side it not never crosses the midline and you can insinuate the finger here below the costal margin unlike liver or spleen and last one is if you percuss on the renal angle it will be dull if it is a kidney very simple okay here is a palpability this is a palpation all these things you should know so these are all the features i just said why you say this particular lump is a kidney lump i will ask you then you have to tell i feel the sir the mass is on the loin essentially does not cross midline it moves with the respiration does not fall forward if you are able to do a knee elbow test but that very seldom we do you omit that in exam but in theory you can write it is by manually palpable palpable common conditions like that tumor and hydronephrosis for you you should remember next important topic i'll give a 2 minutes rest for all of you and for interaction i want to see how you are all doing anybody want to ask question now raja ram if you are still there unmute otherwise i'll try to unmute them yes, sir they can unmute themselves sir yes sir let me you who wants to ask question saranya nishant how are you doing priyanka karmegam is there i think he knows more urology than me hopefully
How are you this morning? Hi, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a little challenge I took myself, even though essentially gastroenterological practice, still as an undergraduate, you know, the importance of knowing all these common topics, very rarely done, because even if they are done, in my opinion, they take one class for each su subject, they lose the track, how much to read, what to concentrate. So that's the reason that motivated me to bring all the chapters in one. I think we are half the way. Let me see whether I do justice for this uh, challenge. Any of your comments or anything you want to add so far or anything you expect this topic should address? I can address that as we go. Another 30 minutes I have. I can compensate whatever I missed. Any particular chapter you think they have to know in the Euro, Euro general system from the undergraduate's perspective. The one thing I'm not going to tell today is how to catheterize a patient. Catheterize is a tricks of the trade that we are going to tell when we show the instruments like a catheter, polycatheter. That is the next module. That's true. Now, one point I want to impress is that uh, polycystic kidney usually it occurs in third decade. Yes. Usually it goes with uh, systemic hypertension, malignant yes. hypertension. Uh, that point, it's, I, I think it will be better uh, if they know. Yeah, polycystic kidney disease is one of the common thing in a patient with hypertension. Polycystic liver disease, polycystic renal disease. Sometimes rarely they also have pancreatic uh, cyst also present in some people. And most of them are asymptomatic. We don't disturb the cyst. But you should realize these people and over a long run, they can be very rarely only they are precancerous. But definitely you have to monitor the renal functions, especially a bilateral polycystic kidney. Okay. Majority of the times it will be bilateral. Yes, that's right. Very often an incidental finding, but you should not press the panic button. Only thing is you need to follow the family closely because sometimes it is like anything, it can run in the family also. So that is a very rare, very important thing, like a familial polyposis or some breast cancer like that. Here also, you need to ask their family members also to get a, a screening done. There is no harm in doing that. So let's go back then. Uh, with that little uh, break we had, may not be enough break, but I think uh, that's all we can share now. So we'll hopefully you are able to see the slide. We'll quickly go. Lower urinary tract, the next important problem, not as an undergraduate, but as a CRRA you will see, is of course is an acute retention of urine. Okay, A patient will come at the 2 or 3 a.m. suddenly, not able to pass urine because not able to pass urine is a very, very uncomfortable, painful situation. You see a patient like a four or five months pregnant patient, like that a suprapubic up to the umbilical level, the blood is distended, they haven't passed urine. They may have a preceding few days of uh, difficulty voiding urine also, but usually it is an acute on chronic. So what is the common thing, common in male, we all know, benign prostatic hypertrophy, Stricture urethra are simple things like phimosis even can present with the acute retention. Female, little less common, but I'm sure in obstetricians practice, they'll very often they see the early pregnancy, a uterus pressing, or a multiple sclerosis is one of the associate thing for returns in urine, if not here, at least in UK. Other causes which we see in practice, a patient with a constipation and a fecal impaction, or patient with a perianal surgery, like pile surgery, or patient who has undergone surgery under spinal anesthesia post-operatively, or patient who has undergone, I mean, under, I mean uh, uh, sustained injury to the spine with a spinal cord injury, with a paraparesis or paraplegia. These people will invariably will have either a painful or a painless retention of urine. The treatment is simple. You relieve the retention by catheterization, but to recognize the entity as it is, by percussing, inspection, palpation and percussion. Inspect may be obvious, but what is the most important thing is suprapubic dullness after making the patient to go and void urine and come back. If it is still there, in a male, it is invariably bladder. In a female, it could be bladder or it could be still maybe something like a pelvic mass, like a uterus or a ovarian cyst. That is a very simple thing you should realize. Ultrasound is going to unreveal the truth, but still you have to attempt as an undergraduate to make a diagnosis at every possible minute clinically in the bedside. That is the message. 
the classical difference between the chronic and acute retention is pain if they have a pain acute retention if they are just lying with a big bladder with a big smile in their face chronic retention there is no need to rush into treatment you can always speak to the urologist and see what is best for the patient and i told you they have two d's they'll have distended bladder and they'll keep on dribbling as they walk to the toilet they usually show the path to the toilet i say they have a dribbling urine they'll take them to their thing treatment of course is you need to catheterize but one powerful message i want to give all of you is whenever you are catheterizing go for the smallest size of the catheter okay the ideal size is 12 or 14 french catheter you put the largest possible size of the tube if you are going to intubate the patient trachea and the smallest tube for the urethra so you be kind to the urethra that's what we say by using a 14 and always be kind to the urethral pain by giving some xylacaine jelly don't make it as a painful uncomfortable lifelong memory okay you make it as a very i mean i mean yes. people should not have any pain or a discomfort they say second time if you are going to catheterize anybody after all i can manage they should not say oh don't do it even to your enemy like that so a very important thing is xylacaine jelly is injected into the urethra wait for a few minutes to act then you take the smaller catheter a latex rubber foley catheter the number size is usually 12 or 14 the number signifies what the circumferences in millimeter next is supra pubically also you can directly put a puncture and a drainage also that is usually urologist or surgeon will do and the treatment of the cause depending upon the common causes okay one of the other pathology you should realize is a bladder stone the bladder stone what you should know as an undergraduate is primary that is it is started from the ureter then it is now it is lying in the bladder usually it is small like size like a 9 mm 10 mm but if you leave it for about another 3 months it may grow for the sedimentation that's all but if it is formed within the bladder itself then usually it is a very large like a size of a lemon or a cricket ball stone if it is invariably it is because of the secondary infection because of the stasis of the urine in the bladder secondary to either a urethral stricture or a prostate very very important or some foreign body in the bladder the stone there it is like a chalk piece like a triple phosphate okay the phosphate stones are like a you can very easily pulverize they are usually due to infection primary stone from the ureter are usually small they are usually oxalate stone and the symptoms i told you already investigation you know by this time what we do is the treatment is the special term cystoscopy they do break the stone into pieces and take it out that is called lithotripsy that is a term it is not lithotripsy it is a litho in other words don't make it like a powder make it as a small pieces then you have a bladder irrigation syringe something like a like a bellow you just put some water and take it out and then you put patient on catheter or spc okay coming to the other equally important short notes you should realize is that i told you already painless hematuria in an elderly person unless proved otherwise it is a bladder cell carcinoma of early stage or more advanced stage depending upon whether it involves only the transitional cell epithelium or to the musculature or even go through the breaches the whole thing so accordingly t1 t2 if it goes to the whole wall t3 go and infiltrate the neighbor it is a t4 same t staging where you have whether it is a bladder cancer stomach cancer same staging more or less if you remember that t staging but i don't think it is necessary for you as an undergraduate but one thing you take it from me sometimes they can have a their i mean occupational hazard if they are expressly working in textiles or dye industry expressly handling the benzene naphthalamine dyes they are prone for bladder cancer one of the common question they ask because chemical carcinogens there are only hardly few one of the areas we always expect the students to know here next of course is the cystosomiasis usually in egypt and thing places like that smoking of course in any cancer for that matter rarely genetic mutation 
okay i told you about the pathology symptoms investigations of course the investigation of choice we will be doing a cystoscopy and a biopsy then if it is operable there are three options whenever you try anything on cancer anywhere in our body right surgery radiotherapy chemotherapy in surgery endoscopic laparoscopic open surgery so if you put these headings alone sometimes something is better than nothing the surgeon will know at least he is thinking like a surgeon or thinking process is at least there all you need to do is filling the gaps you will learn okay so surgery what we do is by cystoscopy that is endoscopically we can do a transurethral resection of bladder tumor it is something different from turp transurethral resection of prostate is called a turp here is turbt if if it is beyond that stage then we remove the whole bladder that is called a radical cystectomy either laparoscopically or open then once you remove the bladder how are you going to void urine you need to put both the ureter implanted into an ileum like a conduit so you bring the ileum outside like a urostomy or there are ways to construct i mean construct what we call a new bladder that is called neo bladder so all those things are a bit too much for you but if you know that you can remove the bladder and you make sure either the ureters are implanted into a segment of ileum brought out as a ileostomy okay a sprouting urostomy or you can make a new bladder from the ileum and join that into the urethra that is called a neo bladder both are possible nowadays with the so much of advancements happening in urology radiotherapy external beam radiotherapy normally given chemo very important for you to understand because as a resident you will be giving this chemo to every patient with the bladder cancer if you are posted in urology ops intravesical chemotherapy and immunotherapy they put a catheter and then put some medicines locally intravesical or sometimes even a bcg can be given intravesical so bcg immunotherapy so this is the two peculiar things you try to remember and write it in bladder cancer that will fetch you more marks okay coming to the prostatic cancer or benign prostatic hyperplasia how much to know sir if you know it is a aging process if you are more than 60 you bound to have a degree of enlargement of prostate how will you know patient symptom what symptom patient will have they may present with nocturia more than two times they have in difficulty in initiating the process of urination they go to the toilet 5 minutes later only they start passing urine even that urine is not like a stream but a dribble sometimes they before reach the toilet they void on their way to the toilet that is called urgency rarely they can even have a hematuria so you should know classical symptoms of prost because that's why we say prostatism in other words prostatism is if the symptoms are so classical even without the putting a finger into the rectum you can see this patient symptoms are so classical i bet he is having a prostatic hypertrophy and then you can send the patient to ultrasound and the sonologist will tell you whether it is a prostate enlarged or not but it is always as a surgeon the prostate is within the reach of your index finger why don't you put the finger in and see anteriorly in the extra rectally the enlarged prostate whether it is a firm smooth or it is hard and nodular if it is firm and smooth benign if it is very hard and also nodularity sign of malignancy sometimes it can be only one lobe sometimes both lobes sometimes only at the middle part of the prostate that is called median lobe hypertrophy okay these are all few things you should know how do they present of course they will have a retention of urine acute or chronic what will you do in addition to hematological biochemical radiological investigations tumor marker psa how much you look for anything above 5 is abnormal how will you confirm whether the patient has a cancer i'll do a true cut biopsy if it is a cancer what do you need to do because it is one of the hormone responsive tumor what other hormone responsive tumor you know breast cancer so what do you do here here because it responds to the people so you need to patient take the patient's testosterone 
came out from his system. So how will you do? Radical treatment is you just remove his both the side testes. That is what normally we do. Subcapsular architectomy. Bilateral architectomy is one of the surgery we do sometimes. But there are various medical treatments that are also available nowadays. So you have to read all those things. But that's but the other additional things we normally advocate before we do a procedure, especially for a benign pathology. But the malignant pathology, of course, the treatment is what I said. When I, you do a urine flow study. In other words, patient will go, pause urine, as he passes urine in a flow meter, the flow meter will measure the speed, the flow speed and how when he initiates, what is the force and things. So it will give a graphical representation of urine flow of the patient. That will indicate whether the patient would benefit from surgery like a TUR prostate. See, this is the normal one here, it's a diagram. Here is a large prostate, especially the middle portion. So this is the way you take a biopsy. You put a finger in the rectum and a finger guided or ultrasound guided probe. Then you can go into the prostate and take a biopsy. And this is the way they operate. They go into the urethroscopy. Then with the diathermy hook, I mean, small thing is there. Then you can just keep grating the coconut. You remember grating the coconut. They scrape the uh, prostate. But why it is not bleeding? Because the whole thing is done with a diathermy. There is energy source of diathermy will ensure you are able to grate the prostate and take it like a small, small, uh, like a grating the coconut and enlarge the channel. It was before, at the end, you can see the how big is the prostatic urethra. You don't remove the whole prostate. You remove only the prostate enough to create a channel. Only if it is a malignancy, you remove the whole prostate that is called a radical prostatectomy. Nowadays, radical prostatectomy is done through the robotic. That's why it's called a robotic prostatectomy. It's reserved only for carcinoma prostate. Whereas we do a transvesical prostatectomy or rarely open transvesical prostatectomy only for malignancy. Sorry, benign condition. Can it be prostate can be medically managed? Somebody asks you. You can make the prostate shrink by giving them all five alpha reductase inhibitor. Okay. Along with that, you can also give them an alpha blocker. Okay. Both in a combination will relieve the symptom in more vast majority of the patient. That's all you need to know. Coming to the two important chapters in the testis. Let's go quickly. In the next five, 15 minutes, I'll finish it. And when we come for the examination part in the next class, I'll tell more about how to examine a hydrocele and things like that. Okay. Coming to the few sh short cases or a spotter you have. One is a carcinoma penis. If it is present, you are unlucky, then they'll keep it for examination. You have to see it like a, an ulcerative growth anywhere in the body. Don't get uh, But the only thing is when it comes to the investigation and treatment, you should know a little bit about the penile cancer because Carcinoma penis is basically a squamous cell carcinoma. All of us don't know. There are a lot of precancerous conditions. What are the precancerous conditions? Like a leukoplakia, white skin. If you have a foreskin is white, that people are a Paget's disease of penis or some warts, viral warts like papilloma later can turn into malignancy. And people have a firm belief circumcision do prevent the occurrence of CA penis at a later date. Like uh, most of the Muslims, Jews, they have a circumcision done and those religion, carcinoma penis is literally unknown. So that is circumcision do have some preventive aspect that you have to mention in your short notes. Pathology, it is a squamous cell carcinoma, so a nodal metastasis into the Groin nodes, both sides groin nodes, especially the horizontal group of lymph nodes involved. TNM staging is applied here also. And you can see the tumor here, for example, there is a five centimeter large ulceral proliferative growth occupying the glands penis with hardly able to see, appreciate the place of the external meatus. Sometimes it may be hidden by a foreskin, that is phimosis. You need to cut the skin in order to have to have a look at the tumor also. That is also a hidden tumor of the carcinoma penis. The old 
the penis itself is swollen because the tumor is hidden by the the foreskin itself treatment is of course before treatment you need to confirm the diagnosis by taking a small wedge biopsy from the edge of the lesion don't take it from the right at the center because center will have necrotic tissue whereas the edge so wedge biopsy from the edge of the lesion wedge and edge both terms you should come in your mouth what is a wedge wedge is a small amount of peripheral tissue along with the normal neighboring skin if you send the pathology is able to keep coming coming from the normal to abnormal area and able to convincingly diagnose cancer and it is usually the biopsy is done under local anesthesia okay treatment is here is the only condition in addition to the bone the surgeon do amputation okay amputation the word we don't say the pinectomy partial pinectomy or thing like that is a amputation of penis either partial or total it is only the glands penis is affected partial amputation if the shaft of the penis is affected then you may have to remove the whole penis that is a total amputation then how patient voids urine the perineal urethra the urethra is like a women so they have to sit down and urinate like that the inguinal block dissection is necessary especially when they have a nodal disease radiotherapy chemotherapy can also be considered so that if you know that's good okay i'm sure you can come back again and listen to my talk i'm sure you will be able to comprehend because each and every word i said there are important okay time is premium so i just want to just finish in time if possible thanks to your cooperation another 15 minutes by 12:30 next two important chapters you have to know as an undergraduate is of course undescended testis the father will bring the son sir my son since birth is having only one side i can feel the testis the other side is the scrotum is empty empty scrotum they'll come like this okay empty scrotum right side and the testis normal on the left side and this undescended testis for this of course the examiner he will ask you and also in the short note you have to write a word about the embryology of descendant testis so one word for this is the caudal migration of the testis because testis to start with was an intra abdominal organ okay it descends into the scrotum thanks to cubiculum testis and also the human chorionic gonadotrophin so this small track from the lower pole of the testis to the scrotum it keeps on getting shortened and it just brings the testis to the deep ring inguinal canal external ring into the bottom of the scrotum okay on its way from the abdomen to the scrotum anywhere if it is stuck then it is called undescended testis if it goes not in the same passage but somewhere out with then you call it ectopic testis ectopic testis it is not not the normal route somewhere else it is also found sometimes ectopic testis that is called okay where all you can find truly intraabdominal within the inguinal canal commonest or a superficial inguinal pouch these are the two common things very easily diagnosed by an ultrasound abdomen okay sometimes we do an investigation like a laparoscopy that is whenever you suspect a intra abdominal testis and what is the sign very important thing is even if you feel the testis you have to ensure you are able to bring the testis to the bottom of the scrotum very very important sometimes you pull the testis it will not come beyond the upper part of the scrotum that is called partial undescended testis or sometimes even a retractile testis but it should be brought nicely to the bottom of the scrotum normally in a very relaxed uh, um, boy but young children they may not cooperate with you so it needs more than one time you have to bring the patient and examine confirm undescended testis is pre cancerous that you should know as well and if you leave it undescended there is a high chance because of the temperature changes it may become malignant second because of the and the position it is also a risk of torsion third important thing is if it is not kept in the real ideal temperature of the scrotum it will lose its function so it will no longer live bilateral undescended testis is one of the rare condition for infertility 
So loss of function, risk of loss of function, that is torsion, risk of malignancy are the reasons why we have to recognize undescended testis and bring it to the bottom of the scrotum at the earliest possible time. I think everybody will agree if you give an answer within the first year of the baby's life, if you are able to bring the testis to the bottom, it is good. If you do it after one year, by the time the testis loses quite a significant amount of its function. So within one year, the answer they will usually expect. Okay. Archidopexy, that is you bring the testis to the bottom. There are various technical terms, don't worry about it. Mobilize the testis, brought with its blood supply and vas deference to the bottom of the scrotum. For it to, in order to retain within the bottom, we put them in what we call a dot toss pouch. What is dot toss pouch? You create a pouch between the scrotal skin and the dot toss muscle. In other words, normally testis is deep to dot toss muscle. Here it is superficial to the dot toss muscle, deep to the skin by creating a pouch. That is a thing. Pictorial representation is you can see it here. Okay. If you don't do this, or if a patient is having a, a long, uh, like a uh, dumbbell, like this type of uh, testis, then they will go in for uh, another important emergency, surgical emergency, we call it a torsion test. The, again, a parents will bring their son, 12-year-old boy. Sir, my son keep complaining severe pain in one side of the scrotum, left side, right side. And the testis looks swollen. He didn't have much sleep. This is a surgical emergency. Anything, torsion of small bowel or obstructed or a strangulated bowel or strangulated inguinal hernia or torsion testis. If you leave it more than six hours, it is irreparable damage. So you have to make sure you wake up the radiologist to do the test, wake up the surgeon to do the surgery. There is a surgical emergency. It is not wait and watch game. It is rush and act game. Okay. So it is a, one of the common cause for painful testis. How will you diagnose? You see a patient who is in pain. Testis is felt higher position. That is not in the bottom of the scrotum. It is tender to feel. And there will be an absence of cremaster reflex. If you make a reflex on either side with your finger like that, then there will be absence of the cremaster muscle contraction on that side. And also, if you raise the bottom of the scrotum up, usually if it is the epididymo architis or inflammation of the testis or scrotum, it will bring down the pain to some extent, but there is no relief here. And one of the investigations we have to do is a color doppler. Color doppler is the investigation of choice. Okay. Then here are all the various differential diagnoses I have given you. The treatment is archidopexy. The only difference of archidopexy here compared to the other one is here there is no need for a dot toss pouch. You can just fix it on both sides with a sutures, at least three point fixation, we call it. Okay. And then you fix not only on the diseased side, but also the other side because the patient may come one month or one year later with the torsion of the other side also. So whenever you do a treatment for torsion test, is it is archidopexy on both sides. That is a very important thing. Next chapter is testicular tumor. And of course, I think the next one is the hydrocele. I think that finishes. So we are reasonably all right to finish in time. Testicular tumor. How much I can tell you today? Undescended testis is a precancerous condition that you already know. So there is one thing you remember that is good. Second, Age dictates the diagnosis. That's the second message. See, I told you in the bone tumor also, if you have a patient in the first decade, Ewing's sarcoma, the second decade, if they are coming, for example, then you can think of a, the next condition that is a, normally the second decade is osteosarcoma. The third decade, osteoclastoma. Fourth decade or fifth decade, they can have secondaries in the bone. Like that, here also, to some extent, you can be able to tell. Okay, Like, for example, if they are in the younger, relatively younger age group, like you, your age group, most of you are in the, the 20 and 30, teratoma of the testis. 
if it is slightly higher age group married person younger like 30 to 40 or beyond seminoma so seminoma is senior teratoma in the tender age group if you just remember that that is well and good okay. they say enlarged painless enlargement of the testis is one of the presentation always whenever you feel a testis is feels heavy stink up the malignancy because hydrocel is only fluid testicular tumor the whole thing is a solid it feels heavy so even in the clinical examination the right side scrotum feels heavy transsilvination test negative i suspect testicular tumor sir whereas if it is a hydrocel it is less heavy it is not heavy and it is fluctuant and brilliantly transsilvination okay by using a luminoscopy so like that you should Differential diagnosis for testicular tumor, of course, is epidural marcaitis or hydrocele. I told you just now how to differentiate. The investigations, I'm sure by this time, because it's being a tumor, in addition to ultrasound, you do a CT. X-ray chest, because testicular tumor can spread through the lymph nodes to the epigastric, that is para-aortic lymph nodes, through the bloodstream, cannonball secondaries, like kidney, here also cannonball secondaries. Like a prostate, testicular tumors also, especially the teratoma, you have a raised alpha fetoprotein, human chorionic gonadotropin. Okay, these two are very, very important. So, as soon as you suspect testicular tumor, the first investigation you do is send the patient's blood for tumor markers. That's the first part because we don't take a biopsy. That itself will tell you the diagnosis. Then staging is there. We'll come to that in a minute. For example, the stage one is confined to the testis. Stage two, lymph nodes. Stage three, distal metastasis. It's very simple. It is not like one, two, three, four, like other conditions. The treatment, one important thing for you as undergraduate is procedure called high architectomy. What do you mean by high architectomy? You don't make an incision in the scrotum. You make that incision in the inguinal region. Don't breathe this, breach the scrotal skin. Okay, because then it's any local recurrence there, it will be very difficult. And if you need to give a radiotherapy that will affect the other side testis also. So you make an inguinal incision, pull the testis through that incision along with the core structures. You examine after putting a clamp right at the deep ring. If you suspect it is a cancer by frozen section, or by feel, you remove the whole testis along with the, the whole spermatic cord right up to the deep ring that is called high architectomy. It is different from the architectomy we do for epididomoarchitis or inflammatory pathology where we do a scrotal incision and remove it. Or for a, a prostatic cancer also we do architectomy for removing the hormonal production of, test, of testosterone. There also it is a scrotal incision. Inguinal incision for architectomy is made only for a testicular tumor. Second, if they develop lymph nodes in the para-aortic region, retroperitoneal nodal dissection may be required. Chemotherapy is very important for testicular tumor, especially teratoma. A combination of cisplatin, methotrexate, bleomycin. Okay, radiotherapy, external beam, rarely it is used. Prognosis, I told you, it is more than 80. It's a good prognosis. Most of the people, they do well. Coming to the last, that is hydrocele. I think we have addressed this when we discussed the hernia chapter. But still, you need to know the different types of hydrocele. That is an abnormal collection of fluid in the processes vaginalis. That the word is very, very important. Processes vaginalis. It can happen in a child congenital. In adult, usually acquired because of primary, that is idiopathic is by far the commonest primary hydrocele or idiopathic hydrocele where there is a tense hydrocele, straw colored fluid hydrocele, whereas secondary hydrocele is secondary to infection of the epididymis or testis, epididymarchitis, or it is secondary to some filarial disease, filariasis or post hernia surgery. Coming to the congenital, that is what very often the parents will bring. Sir, my son is having a swelling in the right side scrotum. In the morning, it looks small. As day go by, by evening, it gets bigger. That means 
they have a patent processes vaginalis so when they lie down at night the fluid in the scrotum it goes through the patent process vaginalis back to the peritoneal cavity as they walk run in the morning fluid trickle down to the patent processes it makes the swelling come bigger so that is a one way to understand so there is a difference of the description is very important so that is a very typical symptom of congenital hydrocele because congenital hydrocele congenital hernia both are less same way they mimic only the ultrasound or careful clinical examination will distinguish but there are two other conditions which will confuse you the only way to understand all this is pictureize everything okay normally you have the testis epididymis once they are back in the scrotum the processes vaginalis okay this one is obliterated so there is no communication with the peritoneal cavity anymore so there is no chance of bowel or fluid to come in but in case if there is a patency then it is a congenital hydrocele morning small swelling evening big swelling congenital hydrocele second sometimes the recanalization will i mean the the whole thing obliterated but for a small part in the inguinal region that is called hydrocele of the cord a fluid filled swelling in the inguinal canal it will different diagnosis for the inguinal hernia bubonal seal the next is two types of hernia incomplete hernia right up to the superficial ring complete hernia right up to the bottom of the scrotum okay all pictureize this so i told you the only difference between the scrotal inguinal scrotal swelling there is a hernia and hydrocele is here you are able to get above the swelling you are the scrotum is there you are able to get above the swelling like this and it is soft and cystic if you feel fluctuation is elicited and transillumination test is positive in most of the people unless it is a infected or secondary hydrocele sometimes it will be absent ultrasound will diagnose different diagnosis testicular tumor epididymis marcaitis treatment two important operation is to remember one is lord's procedure second is eversion of the sac that is called jebolis procedure rarely we do a next one remove the whole tunica vaginalis that is excision of the sac so here is a lord's procedure in other words you open layer by layer skin dartas muscle tunica vaginalis Let, empty all the fluid then all the tunica vaginalis all around you just plicate them this is the plication of the tunica like this so tunica is plicated all around okay like this then testis is bare now it is exposed without covered by the tunica vaginalis this way you will avoid recurrence other thing is you make the inside surface of the tunica outside that is eversion inside out that is a eversion of the sac that is called okay that is called jebolis procedure here for example testis this is the surface which is secreting the fluid you make it as an outside by doing this called a procedure jebolis procedure then you suture this way so the, this secreting surface is in contact with skin now so it will not cause accumulation of fluid in a closed cavity so very simple procedure All right let's finish the thing please unmute yourself you are still muted i'm going to ask first question raga darshini then saranya okay in that order this particular gentleman presenting with the severe pain from the loin to groin on the left side raga darshini what do you think is the diagnosis sir urolithiasis sir can you see any stone yes sir where is near the, the transverse plane yeah where is the stone near the transverse plane line sir no no you are telling but you for example you are on the other end of the fort and you are telling to me i am the surgeon waiting i ask you have you seen the x ray you say yes doctor sir i saw the x ray the thing x ray lobby i can see a 1 cm stone vertically oriented stone just at the level of the tip of the transverse cross on the left side at the level of the fourth lumbar vertebra see like that you have to give a clearly okay, okay. this is if you see this carefully the picture this is sacrum then l5 l4 isn't it it is on the yes. opposite to the l4 left transverse process so it is a left ureteric stone at the level of the tip of its transverse process you say 
then immediately i'll know it is a mid ureteric stone see for example upper ureteric stone up to l3 l4 l5 sacroiliac joint here this region is a mid ureteric stone this is the lower ureteric stone so it will give me i need not come and see the x ray you you may pictureize the whole thing and you are that's the way you communicate so i'm trying to just help you to how to communicate this so you have to be as descriptive as possible your diagnosis is absolutely right but you have to put extra words to make it more much more accurate to comprehend or to discuss with your senior colleagues okay Good. okay sir okay sir so this is left mid ureteric stone and uh, the, i that means it is along the course of the ureter you know the course of the ureter i need not repeat it again okay coming to the next one who is going to tell saranya this particular patient came with severe epigastric pain for the last 6 months and i felt a vague mass the epigastrium so i thought following the ultrasound report of something i did an ivu this is an ivu can you unmute yourself and can you tell me something about this or you try to say something i'll try to build up on this epigastric pain in a patient saranya can you try or who else wants to try priyanka would you try one of you take the challenge no harm done by attempting so hydronephrosis hydronephrosis what you are seeing here let me just take this. so what you see here on either side of the t12 l1 l2 vertebral ridge body is the kidney on the right side kidney on the left side but what do you normally see because you haven't seen a normal kidney it is all the contrast inside will look white like this they are much more closer to the vertebra usually the kidney will be a little bit lateral okay the second important thing is normally the kidney will be facing sideways like that calicial system now they are facing towards you like this so in other words instead of facing sideways the lateral facing calices are now more ventral or anterior facing calices they are facing you actually they are all the end on view of the calices and if you see carefully the lower pole of the right kidney is actually coming closer to the lower pole of the left kidney can you see that here and here so they are trying to meet kissing each other this is the classical appearance of close proximity of the renal calicial pattern to the vertebra and also more anteriorly turned calices third a very easy point for you as undergraduate is the lower pole of the both kidney are much closer in other words they are like this they are kissing the my lower pole are trying to kiss kiss each other like this normally your kidney is slanted like this okay both kidney upper pole is like this the lower pole is away from you now it is like this so it, it, it this is normal and this is what here like that so this is a very classical appearance of horseshoe kidney imagine now you picture is now horseshoe kidney they are all very close because the kidney are pulled to each other towards the aorta and ivc and here there are meeting each other medial end of the lower pole of the kidney are meeting each other there is a classical disc under the kidney is usually slightly lower than the normal level because of the inferior mesenteric artery sometimes they will prevent its ascent up okay so that's a, this is the kidney ureter and the bladder and what are the three important things you will do before you do ivp mod preparation if i am asking you okay you are doing an ivu for this patient tomorrow doctor and uh, what are the preparation what instruction you will give to the patient when to stop eating and how to keep the bowel clean and what test you will do blood test you will do before do ivp can you give an answer for all these three priyanka the creatinine level should be normal Around Good. three to four, sir. No, not three to four. Three to four is abnormal. It is normal is one milligram. If it is more than one, you should not do. One point five is upper normal. Three is chronic renal failure. Three or four is abnormal. You should know the normal value, Priyanka. Okay, right. Okay. Next, next. Overnight fasting and yes, they have to starve. Then only the kidney will be able to concentrate the the contrast you are giving. Fasting is important. Third. Bubble. Sir, see uh, the patient the uh, bubble should be clearance with the uh... you imagine this patient is not past motion the whole gas is there over the calyx it will mask your see all this gas imagine if they are here you will not be able to interpret nicely so it's better to clean the bubble without any gas or motion 
so good bowel preparation for that day, doesn't mean you need to wash the bowel give two dalcolax tablet or dalcoflax tablet okay stimulant laxative laxative you give okay okay then sorry and what is the next small question for you which is the best test eh? for example in this one to diagnose horseshoe kidney if anybody ask you in mcq which one you will click now this is the mcq for you imagine you are writing mcq for your final year exam this is the exam a diagnose a best investigation to confirm a diagnosis of horseshoe kidney is as follows you are given a four option so intravenous neurogram this is what you have seen but i told you 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 find it very difficult to interpret isn't it if same thing if it is in the ct scan the ct scan will give you more information what is because ct scan will show you where the aorta where the ivc vasculature everything so ct is ivp plus anatomy so ct out of the all the four ct is the best investigation see that's the thing we do ivo but when you suspect horseshoe kidney i'll tell you in practice what is uh, under at your level maybe difficult we do ultrasound if the ultrasonologist says it is a horseshoe kidney ideally i should go for a ct abdomen rather than ivp okay i have put ivp here because you are undergraduate undergraduate ivp pictures are very important to interpret especially for horseshoe kidney that's why i put it but uh, as a practice for the mcq the investigation of choice i do ultrasound i do ivp i do ct scan for all case of horseshoe kidney but out of the three investigation the best one still as of now is ct abdomen okay whenever anybody ask that because that gives you the whole it is not only the kidney you are looking in ct the whole abdomen you are looking at so it gives you much more better view here is a patient okay who had i mean rather than a patient a 5 year old boy who had a nephrectomy done okay and this is the diagnosis this i mean what is the diagnosis a 5 year old boy with a nephrectomy specimen let us see how easy from the clue i have given yes why a 5 year old boy is having a nephrectomy it's going to be something tumor what is the tumor in a child wilms tumor okay very simple what is the other name for wilms tumor nephroblastoma what is classical nephroblastoma picture histologically it is a triphasic pattern that word is very important in other words it is having an abortive tubule like thing see all these small small things they are like a tubules you will see some tubules attempting to form tubules and glomerulus so tubule like cells seeds of red cells and then stroma so stroma are like all the pink baby patterns all these dots are the sheet sub cells and here there are all this all empty tubes okay it is in other words it is haphazard arrangements okay it is something like a hamartoma so this is a triphasic pattern very very classical and age group is usually around 3 to 5 years treatment is nephrectomy and followed by chemotherapy and they have a very good survival see close to 90% so that's about wilms chamber okay next last two interesting question is what is gibbons hernia the person you are seeing is actually he is not a surgeon actually he is a british parliamentarian is like our our country mp he is a member of parliament in britain but on his name there was there is a hernia that is called gibbons hernia i think gibbons hernia is a question not for you all i think carmegham if it is still there he can give an answer but if you are not giving anybody wants to give before carmegham comes or i'll give the answer ajay would you like to try who else want to take a challenge karshini you want to try sigana okay let's me tell you this is rare for you this is any patient presenting with hernia with hydrocele is named gibbons hernia because very very important because this particular poor parliamentarian he actually had a swelling of his scrotum okay that was actually people thought it is a hydrocele but it is actually he had a hernia then the hernia after irreducibility strangulation it perforated he developed a peritonitis he died but it was treated as a hydrocele those days before the era of ultrasound and he succumbed to the what was presumed as hydrocele turned out to be a misdiagnosed 
or delayed diagnosis of strangulated hernia. That's why whenever you have a patient with a hydrocele with hernia, they call it as a Gibbons hernia. So any hydrocele, henceforth, whenever you see, hydrocele is a benign condition, you should know. Hernia is a serious life-threatening condition. Why? Because it can strangulate, obstruct. So don't make the misdiagnosis. A misdiagnosis can give, I mean, uh, can lead to loss of life. Like what the, happened to the Gibbon. That's why the name is given. To rip, we don't want to repeat the history. The last one is just for more of an information for all of you. What is the role of MRI sometimes? It gives you a nice TNM staging like a CT. But unlike CT scan, MRI, two important things are without giving you the contrast. If you have a like uh, uh, creatinine level, if it is four or five, you can't give contrast. You can't do IVP. You can't do a CT scan with the contrast. What test we can do? We can do an MRI that will give you a beautiful picture of the patient along with this vasculature. Because MRI is because of the, it is study of the hydrogen atom. Okay, it is on magnetic resonance. It is something on the hydrogen atoms or magnetic resonance is also. So because of that, you are able to see the kidney and also the IVC, the infiltration of the kidney tumor along the IVC very easily seen in the patient with the renal failure. So there is a renal mass with the infiltration of the IVC. Everything can be nicely seen in what we call a, a coronal section, sagittal section, cross section. All these are possible. That's why at your level as an undergraduate, uh, if not, it may be too late for you as a final year, but people in the second and third year, you should understand the anatomy in a three-dimensional plane. Whenever you are, uh, those days are gone where we only do it. So you need to understand from the CT scan perspective or MRI scan perspective. For example, here, this is IOTA, IVC on the right side, IOTA on the left side. This is the right kidney, left kidney, right renal, left renal artery, right renal artery, liver with the hepatic artery, like that you should stomach with fluid, like that you should know everything, okay? IVC thrombus, like this. So with this, I think I'm a little relieved that even though I took a little more time, we were able to give you a bird's eye view on the common topics one expected to read in the urogenital system as an undergraduates. If you are able to listen to this YouTube, either tomorrow or day after, you will be able to understand even better than with that. I'm sure one or two chapters like a testicular tumor, hypernephroma, probably a little bit about a uretric stone if you want to add, well, from the books, you can just take notes and add that. It will make a nice essay for you. So all you can comprehend, 100 pages we have covered. You should be all very happy. Eh? Who is listening to me that you have, we have nearly covered 100. This is the challenge I wanted to take. Make sure we make it as crisp, important things. At the same time, reasonably able to make you understand. Very important challenges I can cut. But I have to uh, use the scissor cut in such a way, important elements are there in your writing and they are easy to comprehend or easy to understand from an undergraduate's perspective. That's what I did, I hopefully. So with that news, we'll see you next week. As I said, the next two weeks are going to be something like challenging like this to know the chapter which you'll struggle to understand or people may not even lecture you because the urologists may not come to in this COVID era. So I thought I'll take the opportunity to bring all the chapters relevant to you. Then the last three classes, 28, 29, hopefully 30 module are going to be the key one that is on instruments, x-rays or specimens, things like that. Okay, with that, have a relaxing rest of the Sunday and see you next week, Sunday. Thank you. Bye-bye.